everybody, and welcome to our Culture Connection speaker series, where we're talking with Americans who have made careers in Russian studies, who share their interest and knowledge in Russian arts, society, culture, and history. We'll see how American attitudes have changed, how tastes have changed over the years, and how Americans are connecting with Russia on a cultural level. My name is Michael Beckelheimer. I'm joining you from Washington, D.C., and this program is supported by the American Center of Moscow and the American Embassy in Moscow. Please remember if you're watching on Telegram or VK or the American Center's YouTube site, um, you can post comments and questions at any time. And for Russian subtitles, please select closed captioning in Russian. Our guest today is Dr. William Mills Todd III, a professor emeritus at Harvard University where among a million things, he was the chairman of the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. He's taught Russian literature for 50 years at Stanford, Yale, and Harvard. And his subjects include medieval Russian literature, 19th century Russian prose, Russian civilization, Dostoevsky, Gogol, Pushkin. You can see why I left this for, for last. This is the, the penultimate interview for a, a a speaker series on Russian culture. Um, Dr. Todd is the um, honorary president of the International Dostoevsky Society and past president of the North American Pushkin Society. So today we'll be talking a lot about Pushkin and also Dostoevsky. Professor Todd, welcome to the series. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's an honor to be invited and uh, welcome to our guests. Thank you for joining us. Um, I want to start with a very basic question, which is, when did you first become interested in Russian liter literature? You have a long career in this field, and it started at an early age. Tell us about it. It's a, it's a very complicated story, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll tell it simply and, and briefly. Uh, my father served uh, in the Army, in Army intelligence during World War II, and he was trained as an officer in the American South in New Orleans. It's brutally hot there. Uh, my mother accompanied him, and the only air-conditioned building in New Orleans was the library of Tulane University. So while he was out on the parade ground uh, sweating profusely, she was reading Russian novels, uh, which she loved, in the library. And as I was growing up, she was always telling me how much she loved Russian novels. Um, when I turned 14, I started reading them myself in English translation, of course, uh, starting with War and Peace and then Dostoevsky, Gogol, Chekhov. Uh, but this was the period in which uh, the Soviet Union had launched Sputnik. And young boys like myself were encouraged not to study literature, but to study mathematics and physics so that maybe America could send up its uh, space rockets. So I went off to university to study mathematics. Professors told me that if I were to be serious about mathematics, I should be able to read not only French and German, which I could, but so much uh, great mathematics was published in Russian. So I started learning Russian to read mathematical treatises. Uh, but along the way, I started being able to read Russian literature. And I completely changed my mind about what to study, my career path, and, and so forth, and uh, took to the study of, of Russian literature. You know, you're not the first person to tell me that you switched from math to Russian which I totally understand, but you are the first person to tell me you studied Russian in order to study math. That's a, that's a new twist. <laughs> yes. Well, in order to read math. And of course, it's, it's fairly easy to read mathematical treatises because so much of the treatise consists of formulae, which are international. Uh, but very soon I could begin to read poetry and simple prose and uh, I was lost to mathematics. So then in college, uh, your, your first degree was then in um, Russian literature. You had um, I, I finished most of the mathematical course, but uh, I did then switch to Russian literature. So that was my degree, yes. 
And then tell us a little bit about your educational path. Well, uh, my teachers at Dartmouth College, where I was an undergraduate, were all members of the old Russian intelligentsia. Uh, my principal teacher, uh, Dmitri von Morenschild, was a Baltic German. Uh, he grew up in a family where he knew English, French, and German. Uh, he was a midshipman in the Imperial Navy. And uh, he escaped Russia and came straight to Yale University, where he did a degree in comparative literature. Another of my great teachers, uh, Nadezhda Karatun, was a um, landowner's daughter, a pomeshtsa in, in Russian. Um, and a third of my teachers had been an artillery officer in the Imperial Army. So the Russian I learned was very much the Russian of, say, Tolstoy's era. And sometimes Russians will tell me that to this day. Um, then I went to Oxford University and uh, worked with a wonderful professor there, John Fennell, who was married to a Russian princess, an emigrant. Uh, and he spoke beautiful Russian, and he loved Pushkin. And he would make me write analyses of Pushkin's lyrics where I, I literally, you know, had to read every sound, uh, every letter. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that because it made me appreciate how incredibly uh, brilliant they were. And then I did my doctorate at Columbia University, uh, which did not have a Pushkinist, a Pushkin scholar. So I was on my own there. Uh, and I wrote my dissertation about uh, letter writing in the uh, Pushkin era. And uh, when I was able to go to the Soviet Union, I uh, read about 10,000 letters from the Pushkin period in the, in the archives and uh, was, uh, able to write a, a, a book about this, but it gave me marvelous insights into the sort of daily life uh, of the educated westernized Russian gentry uh, and was marvelous background for, you know, reading the works of Pushkin and other writers of that time. Uh, I was also privileged in the, in the Soviet Union to meet a number of great uh, Pushkin scholars and literary scholars uh, who were very helpful to me uh, as I sort of worked on my on my projects. I worked mainly in in Leningrad, uh, and they gave me a desk in the uh, Pushkin uh, cabinet, Pushkinsky cabinet, in uh, the Pushkin house, which is the was the Soviet. Uh, Academy of Sciences Institute of Russian Literature. So I had, you know, within easy uh, range, pretty much everything that had ever been written about Pushkin, which was very helpful. I also worked in, in Moscow uh, in archives uh, there, but principally in, in Leningrad and, and later St. Petersburg. So would you say that it was at Oxford that you develop this love or appreciation for Pushkin? Because I think at Dartmouth, you, you, your, senior, your senior topic was about Dostoevsky. It, it was, but uh, I had already started to, you know, love Pushkin and Pushkin scholarship. Um, in 1964, Nabokov published his commentary, his four volume commentary to Eugene and Yegan. And it set off a huge controversy in American literary life. It was probably the most important literary controversy of that, that year and the following year when uh, Nabokov debated uh, leading American critics about how translation should be conducted. Uh, and so I followed this eagerly, uh, certainly. Um, so that's just to say that at that particular moment, Pushkin was very much uh, before not just Americans who studied Russian, but literate Americans in, in general. Did you agree with 
Nabokov's translation? Oh, I, I'm the sort of person who agrees with everyone, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I say this about Nabokov's translation. It is the most brilliant essay I've ever read on the differences between the Russian and English languages. Those commentaries in that translation are absolutely wonderful for someone who's studied Russian for at least two years. If you haven't studied Russian, if you don't know the Russian language, uh, Nabokov's translation is just about unreadable. Uh, and the commentaries aren't all that helpful. But for anyone with just a little bit of Russian, the translation and the commentaries are superb. Uh, I have other translations that I've recommended to my, to my students. I've, over the years, I've taught two kinds of students, uh, as we do in American university life. One are general courses in English translation for people who don't have Russian, uh, and then courses for specialized uh, students and graduate students who do tend to have good Russian. And we don't use translations in those courses. So when I've recommended translations for the people who don't know Russian, I, I recommend different ones. I don't recommend Nabokov's. Sure. Um, tell me, so then in the 1960s, when did you first go to Russia? I first you? went to Russia uh, in the summer of 1965. Uh, it was a five-week tour that followed five weeks of very intense conversational Russian uh, at Indiana University. Uh, Bloomington, Indiana, during the summer is hell on earth. Hot, humid, <laughs> unpleasant. It's a great university. It's just not a great place in the summer. But the reward for surviving five weeks there was five weeks in Moscow, uh, the Caucasus, uh, Pitigorsk, Kislovodsk, uh, Kharkov, uh, and finally uh, St. Peter, or Leningrad, as it was then called. Um, and this was the first time I really had uh, an extensive opportunity to speak Russian. I had learned Russian the way I'd once learned Latin and Greek, sort of as a, as a language that you read, not one that you uh, spoke. But that summer really gave me a chance to uh, begin to speak Russian uh, and to get an appreciation for Russian life, uh, countryside, museums, music, all sorts of things like this. What did you learn about the Soviet Union and about yourself on this first trip as a, as a college student? <laughs> well, what I learned about the Soviet Union was that uh, I spoke with many people and had, you know, many conversations and debates, is I learned that they were very open to meeting foreigners. There weren't that many of us in Russia at that time and could be very critical of their country while loyal to it. And were interested in learning about other countries. Uh, so it was really not at all a belligerent experience, uh, quite the contrary. And it really encouraged me to want to keep learning Russian and to go back as often as I could. So back I, in, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And what I learned about myself is more complicated. <laughs> it was, it confirmed my decision to not become a mathematician, not become a lawyer, which my mother wanted me to do. But I, I really wanted to try to perfect my knowledge of this language, learn its literature, culture, history, and become a, a university teacher of these subjects. Good. So that really cemented the, the plan. And it was, it was my first time abroad, uh, which was important. 
And we were not from a wealthy family. And the trip was entirely paid for by the uh, NDFL program, a, a government program. So. so back in the United States, um, as you mentioned, this was this was the time of Cold War, the space race. Right. Um, what were the perceptions of you and your choice and others around you to study Russian literature? What, what, I mean, now it's perfectly normal, but back then, what were the, what were the attitudes? Well, it was, it, my mother understood because she loved Russian literature. Uh, although she did want me to become a lawyer, uh, family friends, uh, especially of the older generation, were worried that because I learned Russian, I would become a communist or something, uh, which wasn't the case. Uh, but uh, people were surprised because no one was of Russian or Slavic descent in my family. And we didn't really have family friends who were of Russian or Slavic descent. So this was quite a surprise to everyone when I when I did this. What was uh, what were relations like? I'm thinking of your time there at Dartmouth and then at Oxford and Columbia. I'm, you, between those of you who were studying Russian culture, Russian language, literature, and then the the Kremlinologists who are focused <laughs> on policy and you know our cold right. warrior and training. Well, I. I had to take at Dartmouth some of those courses on Soviet politics or Soviet history. Uh, but uh, the people I was studying with were not fanatic cold warriors. Uh, I generally had pretty good relations with them. And in my career, I have taught Russian history. And I have, you know, on occasion had to give many lectures on uh, contemporary Soviet politics or economics or something. It's not something I particularly enjoy doing. Um, but, uh, you know, when you teach a foreign language and literature, you have to contextualize it. You're not just teaching the works of literature. You also have to provide historical social, political, economic background. I mean, say, just to turn for a moment to the Pushkin period, you know, the, the people who wrote and read the literature were members of a particular social group, the educated westernized gentry. What did that mean? What were the educational possibilities of the time? What does westernized mean? Well, that they knew foreign languages and their education had been oriented in that direction. Uh, and gentry, dvaryanstva in, in Russian. What did that mean? Because that wasn't exactly the same thing as, let's say, the European nobility. So that when I teach literature, I often have to briefly, to be sure, explicate things of this sort. Um, so I've never been in some very narrow sense, a purely literary scholar. Although that's the center of my life, obviously. Sure. sure. So then let's talk about your teaching of Pushkin and tell us about, you started out as a professor at Stanford yes. and wanted, wanted to teach a course on Pushkin. Tell us about that and what that meant. Well, um, it should be obvious to any uh, Russians in our audience that uh, being able to being allowed to teach Pushkin is a huge privilege, and uh, such is Pushkin's brilliance that everyone wants to teach him. And I was the youngest professor in the department, and an older professor uh, wanted to teach Pushkin, so I didn't get to at Stanford. I was there for sixteen years. I wrote two books on Pushkin during that time. And I would 
managed to teach Pushkin in other courses I was teaching, like courses on 19th century Russian literature or uh, in my comparative literature courses where I say taught Pushkin alongside uh, Byron or Stern or uh, Stendhal, you know, French, German, English writers of the time. Uh, or I taught courses in literary theory where, say, we would study Pushkin's narratives. But I didn't get to teach a proper Pushkin seminar until I came here. And uh, here at Harvard, uh, at the moment, I am one of three people who loves to teach Pushkin. So we take turns and we teach different aspects of Pushkin. Uh, I was a visiting professor at Yale, and I got to teach two Pushkin courses there, which was a great uh, privilege and pleasure. So during that time at Stanford, when this uh, more senior professor was teaching Pushkin, were you, um, what did you learn from the way he or she taught Pushkin, and did you approve of that course? Well, uh, the answer to the first question is not much. And uh, no, I didn't particularly like the way he taught it. Uh, but, you know, this is in the nature of things, uh, as Pushkin himself might say. And so I, um, Pushkin has a line from one of his famous poems, Hraniti Gordia Tirpenia, you know, sort of maintain your proud patience. So I maintained my proud patience until I got to uh, Harvard and Yale. So then tell us about your Pushkin course. What, how was it structured and what did you teach them and what did you want your students to learn about Pushkin? Most of all, I wanted them to learn that Pushkin was a figure who reached out, confronted all the forces of his time uh, and tried to understand them. So literature, world literature, not just Russian literature, uh, world history, not just Russian history, uh, that he confronted uh, other works, other writers, other cultures uh, in a very dynamic way uh, throughout his brief life. And I wanted them to have a sense of Pushkin's dynamism and, and intensity and creativity, not to visualize Pushkin as some bronze figure on a, in a statue, you know. Uh, Second, I, I really wanted them to uh, appreciate the brilliance and intensity of his writing. So we were always careful to read works, you know, closely. Um, and I wanted them to be able to develop their own sense of, of Pushkin. And so I would assign them papers to write, uh, as the Russians say. Uh, and I would have them give oral presentations and we would critique these. This was a seminar course I was teaching. Um, but Pushkin's confrontations with literature, with the genre system of his time, uh, with European thought, uh, with history, I, I wanted them to have a sense of all of this. Do students, did your students arrive at your seminar with any doubt as to Pushkin's brilliance? Because sometimes there seems to, well, there is this myth around Pushkin, and it's almost cliche to say that Pushkin is brilliant and he is a genius. Yeah, right. So is there is there ever any skepticism? Do you ever have to, do you ever find yourself with your students saying, no, really? This is how great Pushkin is, and this is why. I, I always wanted to say why, whether they questioned it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I never had to deal with that. 
and that's fascinating. But understand that they couldn't take the course until they'd studied Russian for at least a couple of years, typically three or four, sometimes as little as two. Um, so they already had a sense of who Pushkin was. Um, and they would have read some of his, his works. I actually have encountered more skepticism about Pushkin um, in, with Russians in, say, the Soviet Union or uh, in Russia than I ever have uh, in England or America. Yeah. And that is a very complicated question, but it was sometimes fashionable for people after they'd had a few vodkas to say, no, I think Baratinsky is a greater poet, let's say, uh, or uh, Pushkin is no Shakespeare or something like this. Um, and I think that was just, you know, for the purposes of conversation, perhaps. Right. Uh, but as, as you well know, there have been periods in Russian literary history where for many Russians, Pushkin was someone to be ignored or to be denigrated. Uh, the decades right after his death, it was his fellow writers who for the most part kept the memory of him alive and vital. Uh, many critics uh, downplayed his importance and readers who were not deeply cultured moved on to other writers. So, but I've never, never among my own students encountered that uh, negativity or skepticism. Good. And I, some of it may be that they just are responding to my enthusiasm. Right. Right. But again, I always, I didn't assert that Pushkin was great. I tried to demonstrate you know, exactly. why? So do you ever refer to him as a genius? I do. And um, those of us who've been schooled in mathematics, where people really are geniuses, don't use that term lightly. I've never used it in a recommendation for a student, for example, even though I've had wonderfully brilliant students. But genius to me, implies several things. First, it implies something that seems to have been innate. And let's remember that Pushkin was publishing, you know, writing excellent verse and publishing it by age 15. Uh, by age 17, he was acknowledged by his fellow writers as, you know, potentially the best of them. And by his early 20s, he was certainly acknowledged as that. Um, second, it implies to me uh, a kind of versatility. Uh, and when Apollon Grigoriev in 1859 famously said that Pushkin is our everything, Nashavsyo, uh, he could have meant, among other things, that Pushkin tried his hand at writing just about everything. And he excelled at whatever he put his hand to, uh, from four line epigrams to a novel in verse, to historical drama, to many different types of lyrics, criticism, uh, table talk, all sorts of things. Uh, and third, uh, I find that when I read Pushkin and am able to read a work very closely, I discover just amazing things about his gift for language and his ability to work with the grammar, the syntax, the different stylistic registers of Russian. And he did all this at a time when there weren't that many other people in Russia 
able to come close to this. So there's a uh, element of sorry, founding, well, we say in English, don't we, founding genius about Pushkin's work. When you were in Leningrad doing your early research on letters, um, mm -hmm. I imagine you read a lot of Pushkin's letters. Oh, of and, course. Of uh, course. All, all 800 of them. <laughs> What, is it, what was his letter writing style? Well, it varied uh, according to his recipient and according to the type of letter it was. You know, if he was writing a letter to a high government official, uh, he wrote in French. And Pushkin did have wonderfully fluent French, but it was very formal and kind of old fashioned French although, as I say, absolutely fluent and uh, literate. Uh, but when he wrote to his friends, uh, it's full of humor, um, crisp formulations, uh, shocking statements, uh, some obscenity, uh, artfully used, um, and just very, very lively. It's very terse. His letters are terse for the most part. And indeed, Pushkin's prose style is very terse, you know, sort of subject predicate period. Uh, not that many adjectives and adverbs. Um, rather straightforward. Uh, his letters to his wife uh, were in French before they were married. After they were married, uh, he wrote in uh, very vernacular and down-to-earth, uh, warm and affectionate Russian. But it, it, uh, part of the art of letter writing was to write for two audiences at the same time, for your immediate recipient. And so you address that person's uh, interests, achievements, abilities, whatever, but also write for posterity because these writers saved each other's letters and did indeed eventually publish them. And the third audience be the censor? Uh, when they were published, yes. But of course, before they were published, uh, they weren't written for the censor. And often, um, by the time they were published, which was often decades after their death, uh, the censorship was less hard than it would have been if they had tried to publish them immediately. Now, uh, obscene terms were uh, replaced with blanks because one of the tasks of the censorship in the imperial era was not just to protect the dignity of the state and the church and of individuals, but also protect the dignity of the language. But it's pretty easy to tell what the obscenities were. Uh, and again, in Pushkin's case, uh, they're very artful. Your students must love knowing that this, this brilliant poet also has this, you know, unconstrainable personality and, and he's yes. lofty and, and has a lot of fun. Absolutely. And I think students respond very much to Pushkin's humor, obstreperousness, sense of fun, irony, playfulness. Uh, and after all, he was pretty much their age. You know, I'd, I always tell them, and they groan, because these are graduate students, so they're maybe between, say, 22 and 28 years old. Uh, you know, I say, gee, by the time, you know, Pushkin was your age, he'd written Eugene and Yegan and uh, wonderful narrative poems, great lyric poetry, was regarded as the greatest poet of his time. <laughs> The implication, not very nice. very <laughs> the implication of Ben, you know, what have you guys done? <laughs> that's, that's terrible. Um, 
<laughs> what, uh, what, what works do your students love the most typically? That's a really good question. I think a, a way to answer that is to look at what they most often write their term papers about. Mm -hmm. And I think they most often over the years have written their term papers about Pushkin's uh, narrative poems, both uh, from the early 1820s, so that would be The Prisoner of the Caucasus, uh, The Fountain of Bakhchi Sarai, uh, and um, especially Gypsies. Uh, and then they also very frequently write about what to me is his greatest narrative poem, The Bronze Horseman, Miedny Sadnik. Uh, they also write a great deal about Eugene and Yegin. And then sometimes I'll write about individual lyric poems, but I think more the narrative works. Do they ever, how much interest do they show in his, in Pushkin's interest in history and uncovering the history of Russia, the history of his family? I um, always make a point of including these works. Uh, a section of the course I would call Pushkin's Encounters with History. And with that, I would include uh, Pushkin's encounters with, you know, the history of literature, uh, Pushkin's encounters uh, with Russian history. And I would uh, typically end with uh, the Bronze Horseman, uh, where, you know, in uh, just the most brilliant way possible. He sort of, in writing about Petersburg and Peters the Great, sort of rehearses the history of Russian literature through its styles uh, and rehearses central sort of conflicts in, in Russian history. And then I also... Uh, teach uh, sometimes both, but often one or the other. I teach the uh, works he wrote about the Pugachev uprising in the 1770s. This extraordinary uprising that covered really almost all of Russia east of the, of the Volga. Uh, it really shook the empire to its foundations. And Pushkin wrote two wonderful texts about this. One is the historical novel, The Captain's Daughter, where, you know, brilliant novelist that he is, he captured the points of view of sort of both sides, uh, stylistically, ideologically, culturally. And then I also teach uh, his history of Pugachev. Uh, in his time, he had to call it the history of the Pugachev uprising. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now it's it's simply called the history of Pugachev. And uh, Pushkin wrote that with imperial funding, imperial sponsorship. And he delivered a copy uh, to the emperor Nicholas I. And not being of a very high opinion of the intelligence of Nicholas I. He wrote a, a one-page memorandum in which he spelled out his principal points. Uh, but my favorite part of the history of Pugachev is the first chapter in which um, he writes about the beginnings of this uprising which took place east of the Volga, in the Yaik uh, River region. And he told that history in terms of the um, progressive repression of the culture of the Cossacks in that area, who had their own language, their own government, their own legal system, their own culture. <clears throat> 
and the ways in which the empire progressively repressed that, and the way that the resentment of these people built up. And Pushkin writes something which is just brilliant historiography. He said that all that was needed for this uprising was a leader. A leader was soon found. In other words, the forces of history produce this, this leader and the forces of history propelled forward the Cossack Pugachev, uh, who became sort of the instrument of the uprising as much as its, its leader. Pushkin, uh, in ways that his contemporaries didn't fully appreciate, was a great reader and a serious reader. His library had about 1,500 volumes. We have a catalog of it, of which two thirds of the books were in foreign languages. He read the most sophisticated historians of his time. He really thought deeply about history and he embodied that deep thought in his writing. But he was a writer, he was a novelist, he was a creator of narrative works. So he didn't write in the style of a historian, but more as someone who was used to creating plots and characters and so forth, and characters in conflict with each other. Um, but we do read the historical writing in the courses. Have, uh, go ahead. Have you noticed over the years, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to talk to you because I mean, you've seen, you've been teaching Pushkin for a long time and, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you've seen many changes in Russia and in the US. Have you noticed, or did you notice in maybe the late 80s, early 90s, when it was more possible for your students to travel to Russia, to study in Russia, to actually go to the statue of the bronze horseman and really take it all in. Was there a discernible difference in how your students re related to Russian literature once they were free to go to Russia and study it there? Um. Yes, uh, and in complicated ways. First of all, my students were generally able to get to Russia uh, from the 1970s on through language programs. Uh, and then when they became graduate, advanced graduate students, they could go, as I did, live there for a year to do dissertation research. But by that time they were finished taking courses so I didn't see the impact on their coursework. Mm -hmm. What happened later was that they could go there as young students for a year. And so by the time they were taking my graduate courses, they knew Russian very well. They'd lived in Russia. They'd spoken with Russians about literature. Um, and part of the difference was they tended to know contemporary Russian literature much better than my earlier students had. So they, you know, would have read the poems of Brodsky and Kushner and, and other contemporary poets. They would have read contemporary prose. Uh, they might have even met some of these people, as indeed I was able to do. Uh, so they could put Russian literature in a much deeper historical context than, of course, we could back in the 1960s. But the second thing that happened that was of huge importance was the advent of Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev. And this especially came to the fore, oh, by say 1989, 90, 91, uh, before the fall of the Soviet Union. And then for some years after, 
So I would have students who would have lived for in Russia for three or four years, even maybe teaching English, and they would uh, have wonderful Russian and would really be deeply conversant with Russian culture. Finally, uh, what happened, say, from 1990 on, is I would we would have Russians come to study with us. You know, I, I, I had a student who was a young man in Moscow, and he thought it would be fun to go to Harvard. So he applied to Harvard. He was accepted and came as an undergraduate. Uh, and has since become a, a very accomplished English poet. He still lives in this country. And uh, a couple of years ago, he translated a collection of Pushkin's lyrics that was beautifully done. Um, many of our students uh, in the last 25 years or so have been either people who've come from Russia or people whose maybe parents came from Russia, but who grew up in Russian speaking families. And that's been a huge difference because when I started teaching uh, in the late 1960s, the early 70s, we had none of these people. I'm sure it adds a lot to the class to have native Russian speakers who have that culture and history as part of their, their um, environment growing up to share that with. It does, but it's and also fun it. sometimes because the Russian language has changed since Pushkin's time. And words which meant one thing in Pushkin's time can mean something very different now. So I'll have a little fun on the first day of the seminar or whatever, uh, asking you know one of these recent arrivals to translate a couple of lines of Pushkin that have some of these words which have changed meaning. And they won't necessarily know. So that's a good way to illustrate to the class as a whole that when you read Pushkin seriously uh, and you come to a word you're uncertain about, you should look it up. And we have, thanks to academician Vinogradov, a four volume dictionary of Pushkin's language. Yeah. Uh, and I donated a copy of this to our departmental library. And I have another copy for myself because before they came into class to give an oral report on one of Pushkin's works, I wanted them to be sure they knew what the words meant. Uh, what, is, what is most challenging for Russian students? I mean, for, you, for your students who are studying Russian literature in the native language or trying to understand Pushkin? I think it's what would be challenging for Russians to learn learning English. Uh, Russian is like English in this regard. It is very rich in stylistic registers. In English, after all, we have very formal words from Latin and Greek and so forth, all the way down to very idiomatic regional jargons uh, obscenities, things like this. And it's often harder for students to learn that very idiomatic kind of subliterary language than the very formal uh, language. So that can, that can uh, be hard for them. Um, sometimes it can be hard for them in reading Pushkin, uh, especially his poetry, which uh, like all poetry, you know, has syntactic inversions. Uh, words are out of their normal order. And sometimes he does this to parody old-fashioned poetry, which had many such inversions, 18th century Russian poetry did. And sometimes he does it to imitate the complexity of thought. 
of a figure such as Eugene and Yegan. Um, but I have to work closely with them sometimes on these areas of the language. Uh, but in general, uh, Pushkin becomes readable once you have a certain uh, experience in it. And it becomes not just readable, but absolutely delightful. We have a question. Um, what brings American students to your classes if they don't have previous connections to Russia from their family or elsewhere? Uh, the huge the answer to that is the huge international prestige of Russian literature. Uh, which has been true really since the late 19th century. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Turgenev, Chekhov uh, are international figures. They've been widely translated uh, really since the end of the 19th century. And say, like my mother uh, in the early 1940s, sitting in the library, you know, reading Russian novels, Americans know Russian fiction. They tend not to know Pushkin so well, uh, except from music, you know, from the operas and ballets, which have often set Pushkin's works to music. Uh, but no, Russian literature has tremendous prestige. I point out to my students that uh, when Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which is probably his most popular novel in the United States, was first published as a separate edition, the print run was 2,000 copies. I tell the students there are 10,000 students on the Harvard campus. And I would be very surprised if at least 5,000 of them had not read Crime and Punishment. I mean, that's how widespread uh, knowledge of the classic Russian novels is. Exactly. And for so many of our, our guests and, you know, in this particular speaker series, it's, it's those Russian novels that bring a lot of Americans to Russian studies in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. I first read, you know, in the milieu in which I grew up, everyone would debate whether the greatest novel ever written was War and Peace or Anna Karenina. So I read War and Peace when I was 14. I'm sure I didn't understand nearly a, a fraction of what I should have understood, but I, you know, I felt the cultural pressure to read it. And that brings students to our courses. What are um, what are some of the topics that student American students are interested in now in in research? And I'm I'm asking, I guess, specifically about Pushkin's African heritage because I've seen a great interest in this. What has your experience been? Well, I uh, for a long time had no idea how important this was in American culture. But when I first uh, came to Harvard in 1988 and was doing the preparation for my Pushkin seminar, I wanted to see what people had known in America about Pushkin. And it turned out that half of the articles, essays, works written about Pushkin in the United States appeared in the African-American press, in newspapers, uh, in journals, in books. Um, there is extraordinary interest and pride in Pushkin among African-Americans. That's the part of the American population that best knows Pushkin. And indeed, the first article ever written about Pushkin uh, was written in 1840 by an Ameri famous American abolitionist, uh, William Lloyd Garrison. Um, 
and it was written in an abolitionist newspaper. So um, I've been a number of times invited to lecture about Pushkin in Harvard's courses on African-American culture. Uh, and there's been some wonderful scholarship on this in recent years. I mean, just to give two examples, uh, in 1999 at a huge Pushkin festival in Moscow, I met a young African uh, from the country of Chad. Uh, Dieu donné à mon Dieu uh, was his name. Uh, and uh, he published a book, first in French, then in Russian, about Pushkin's African heritage, in which he carefully traced Pushkin's origins, not to Ethiopia, which had long been thought, uh, but to the country of Chad and to a very precise place, uh, which uh, Pushkin's great grandfather, the African Anibal, and uh, seem to remember. Then uh, there's a wonderful collection of uh, articles about Pushkin's African-American heritage produced by American scholars. And one of the articles was written by uh, an American artist who knows Russian and has a doctorate in Russian literature. And he studied the portraits of Pushkin from Pushkin's time to the present and showed that there's a certain tendency in those portraits to make Pushkin's features more European. His nose thinner, his lips thinner, his hair straighter. Um, but Pushkin himself was an accomplished sketcher and he would write little sketches in his notebooks. And a, a famous uh, sketch shows him doing a self-portrait when he was young. And he painted himself or sketched himself with very African features. Uh, and this article wrote about that, that process. So uh, this is definitely something uh, that has interested our students in, in recent years. I think there's a lot of interest in Pushkin's interaction with non-Russian peoples of the Russian Empire. Uh, whereas, say, an earlier generation, like mine, was more interested in Pushkin's interaction with European literature. And uh, Pushkin, of course, was this marvelously cosmopolitan writer and, and thinker, and he owns so many books in foreign languages. But the great irony of Pushkin's life is that he never left the boundaries of the Russian Empire. Uh, in 1829, <clears throat> he went to sort of report on the Russian campaign against the Turks. And as he followed the army, and the army conquered more territory, he was always within the bounds of, of Russia. Uh, but they're interested in such works as, uh, for example, uh, the account of that journey, uh, the journey to our room. Or they're interested, I've had students write very good papers about Pushkin in Poland and his interaction with the Poland's national poet, Adam Mickiewicz. Uh, that's one current topic of interest. Another topic of interest is less in Pushkin, sort of the poet of Imperial Russia or less in Pushkin as a political figure or an opponent of the uh, imperial regime, which is the way he was often studied in Soviet times. But now the interest is more in the intimacy and humor of Pushkin's writing and Pushkin's ability to break taboos. 
to challenge conventions. We've had several very good books about this in recent years, uh, published, you know, in this in this country. So again, that phenomenon, uh, Pushkin is our everything. You know, there seems to be something there for everybody to study. And then there are qualities of Pushkin's writing, which always leave something new to be said. In the early 1820s, Pushkin's uh, friend and poetic colleague, Vyazemsky, wrote a review of Pushkin, in which he talked about Pushkin's, in the Russian term, which I'll leave to our poor interpreters, uh, I, I won't leave, is neodiskosnost, the quality of not spelling something absolutely out. In other words, there can be often a kind of ambiguity to Pushkin's writing, which lends itself then to multiple interpretations. And often these interpretations turn on very fine points of grammar, vocabulary, even punctuation. Uh, and uh, that makes Pushkin just an, an, a never ending source of of wonder and of possible engagement. You know, that, that point about how Pushkin can be, can mean different things to different people. You can find, yeah. you, I, guess, I often refer to him as like the Bible because anyone can find anything they want in Pushkin. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about Dostoevsky's speech about Pushkin. Right. Is it? In, in the in the West or in, in scholarly circles or in your mind, is that considered a just an emotional uh, an emotional speech uh, with a, with an agenda that Dostoevsky wanted to present Pushkin in a certain way to further his own ideas, or is it a and is it an accurate description of of, of Pushkin? Is it legitimate? Well, ask yourself the following question, or I ask myself the following question. If Dostoevsky hadn't read Pushkin, if Dostoevsky hadn't been invited to give a speech at the great Pushkin commemoration of, of 1880 in Moscow, where he gave that speech, would it have made any difference to Dostoevsky's ideological writings, say in Dostoevsky's great journalistic project, The Diary of a Writer. And I'm inclined to say no. In other words, Dostoevsky didn't need Pushkin to talk about the historical Christian mission of the Russian people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in his treatment of, and Dostoevsky treats primarily two works of Pushkin's in that speech. One is The Gypsies, uh, and the other is Eugene and Yegin. And what, Push, what Dostoevsky writes about those two works is based on material in those works and is a legitimate interpretation of the sort of what you might call a guiding idea of the works. So my answer, I, I hope, wasn't too, uh, what do I say, um, un, unclear, because it's a, it's a complicated question. But much of the power of Dostoevsky's speech wasn't in its analysis of Pushkin. It was in its emotional charge. And it was a huge triumph for Dostoevsky. People ran up onto the stage and embraced him and gave him flowers and cried, prophet, prophet, you know, prorok. <laughs> 
uh, you know, from the audience. They pushed aside poor Turgenev so that they could get to Dostoevsky and congratulate him. Uh, so it was an extraordinary public moment, but read afterwards in cold print, you know, there's, there's much that's debatable about it. And there's much even to adopt a line from Shakespeare that makes one think that Dostoevsky is protesting too much. One of the most fascinating lines in Russian readings of Pushkin is a certain residual fear or uncertainty about their national poet that maybe he doesn't live up. And the most extreme version of this I ever read was in the great Russian uh, religious philosopher, Vladimir Solovyov, who writes an essay that is very critical of Pushkin by comparison with Lermontov, Byron, and other romantic poets on the grounds that he can't find a central core to Pushkin's personality. And a different but related kind of uncertainty you see in Gogol's uh, famous 1834 essay, which proclaims Pushkin the national poet, but which nevertheless in its protesting too much, seems to express a little bit of doubt about this. And I find some of that in Dostoevsky's speech. Uh, and you can kind of understand why. Pushkin died young. Many of his works were incomplete. As many as half of his works were never completed. Many of his works were never published in his lifetime. And a number of them weren't even published by 1880. Uh, some of his finest poetry, um, even narrative poems, uh, were very slow to be published. And there's always a sense kind of, or not always, but with many a sense of what if, you know, what if Pushkin had lived, uh, as the Bible says, we're entitled to live three score and 10 years, 70 years. What if Pushkin had lived to 70? You know, what would have happened then? But uh, that said, I see this doubt sometimes um, creeping into Russian discussions. I don't, curiously enough, see it creeping into the discussions of Pushkin by overseas scholars, and especially American ones. We have a question, a couple questions. Um, given that Pushkin is considered to be rather difficult to translate, what translations are the best, in your opinion? Um, excellent question. And... For the prose works, my favorite translations, and it's a Pushkin's complete prose uh, fiction, was by a scholar named Paul Deprezeni, published by the Stanford Press. My favorite translation of Eugene and Yegin, for people who don't know Russian, is by James Phelan. Uh, F-A-L-E-N. And he's also translated Pushkin's lyric poetry very well. Um, favorite uh, translations of Pushkin's uh, criticism, uh, Tatiana Wolf, uh, 
favorite translation of Pushkin's letters, and we have Pushkin's complete letters in English uh, by uh, Thomas Shaw. So we actually have all of Pushkin in English. Um, a wealthy Englishman funded a few years ago a 15-volume collected works of Pushkin. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have this. We do have good translations of, of Pushkin, but it's just so hard to translate the poetry, and especially the lyric poetry, that, as I said earlier in our conversation, for people who have some Russian, I really recommend the Nabokov translation of Onyegin. Uh, another question, which um, of course we must get all the time, but we all want to know, what is your favorite Pushkin work? Do you have a favorite? Uh, I do. And I think we have a question in English. Uh, you're, you're asked sometime, if you could only take one book to a desert island, <laughs> which book would you take? Uh, if I were to ask which of Pushkin's works would I take to that desert island uh, as the only book I could read, it would be Eugene and Yegan. Uh, but I would really regret not being able to take the entire 17 volume set of Pushkin's works. Which book would you take if you weren't limited to Pushkin? It would be between three. It would be the Oxford uh, thin paper, India paper edition of Shakespeare's works, or it would be Eugene and Yegan, or it would be Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. I had a feeling that, would, that, that Dostoevsky would be in there as well. Right, but please don't ask me to make that <laughs> choice. <laughs> Listen, so you're working on some projects today. You're, you're retired from Harvard, but you're still working. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, tell us about your projects. Well, if I could swivel this and you would see how messy my office is, <laughs> that's because I'm writing an essay on uh, the process of the canonization of 19th century Russian literature, especially the novel. And it's a slow, complicated process. Uh, and I'm enjoying that, but it's going slowly. What are you what are you looking at? The process, how the how those novels were chosen? I'm, I'm looking at uh, a set of materials, publication records. Uh, I'm looking at uh, educational curricula, you know what was taught in the schools throughout the 19th century. Uh, I'm looking at critical reviews in newspapers and journals. Uh, and I'm looking at the vast body of literature which did not become canonical. How vast was that? I wanted to ask you, was there a, a lot? Is, there is a huge body of Russian literature, which nobody reads. And my friend and colleague, Jeffrey Brooks, wrote uh, a book about this. It's called What and When Russia Learned to Read. And he reminds us that there was a body of cheap Russian literature uh, what we would call in English uh, chapbooks or broadsides. Uh, the Russian term is lubok, lubochne literatura, uh, for the benefit of our interpreters. And there were many novels published in this format. These are often illustrated works, like comic books, say. And uh, no critics paid any attention to them. They weren't taught in the schools. Uh, for the most part, they weren't collected in libraries. Um, they could be 
processed in some way by the vast majority of Russians who are not literate in the 19th century. And if it weren't for the work of a few scholars like Jeffrey Brooks, we would know nothing about these. Is your task to identify some possible books that should be up there with War and Peace and Brothers Farewell? <laughs> I, uh, I do have some, but uh, they are not from the realms of Lubok literature. But just to give you an example, there was a, a writer of this literature named Ivan Krylov. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a very famous Ivan Krylov who is a canonical writer. He wrote fables. Russians know them by heart. There was another Ivan Krylov who wrote one of these cheap novels. It's called The Story of How a Simple Soldier Saved Peter the Great. It went through 43 different printings in the 19th century. Let's compare that to my first Russian novel, War and Peace, which many people think is the greatest novel ever written. In 19th century Russia, it only appeared as a separate volume uh, in four editions. In other words, this other novel, which you've never heard of, and nobody will blame you for not having heard about it, uh, was reprinted over 10 times as often as Tolstoy's great novel. Now, this, this literature, this uh, chapbook literature, this Lubochne uh, literature, disappeared in 1917. The new Soviet regime put an end to it. Uh, the new Soviet regime uh, had choices as to what to use in its literacy campaigns. And it by and large chose uh, canonical Russian literature, the classics, Pushkin, Gorbachev, Lermontov, Tolstoy, to a lesser extent, maybe Dostoevsky, and a few other writers uh, from the 19th century. Uh, but this um, cheap literature uh, has been by and large forgotten. And I'm not trying to resurrect it. I'm just trying to tell people it was out there. Interesting. Um, but, again, but again, I mean, there's more to becoming part of the canon than just being popular. Yes, right? there is. And uh, it involves a number, a complex of things. Uh, critical attention, uh, being incorporated into school programs. You know, part of the reason all Russians have read Pushkin is because he's taught in the schools, mm -hmm. after all. Right. Uh, and uh, it involves the availability uh, of the literature. And Pushkin has been published since his copyrights expired in 1887, 50 years after his death, has been published in millions and millions of copies. So, yeah, he's out there. He's out there. Well, Bill, I'm so appreciative that you came to talk to us today. This has been really, this is like a, a free course on Pushkin and, <laughs> and oh. so interesting to hear your stories. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's, there's nothing I enjoy more uh, <laughs> than talking about Pushkin. So thank you and, and thank you to our audience and our interpreters. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye.